let, let's start with just the really kind of basics here. I mean, um, uh, let's say, you know, <clears throat> a coworker here goes to Walmart or Amazon, buys a drone tomorrow, receives it that same day or the next day. Are they required to do anything before flying it? Is there any registration process or any test process to fly a drone recreationally? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think that's one of the, the key messages we want to get out is that uh, when you when you buy a drone, in a sense, you're buying an aircraft. And because of that, there are some requirements that the FAA has for that aircraft you just purchased. I would start with going to our website at faa.gov forward slash UAS. That's going to have really a step-by-step -step instructional list of what somebody would need to do after purchasing a drone. But the Cliff Notes version of that would be the first thing you want is to register your drone. Uh, you can go to our FAA.gov website and follow the links there to register. It costs $5. And as a recreational flyer, that $5 registration is good for all the drones you fly. So whether you have one or 10, it's still only $5. The very next thing I would do would be to take the recreational UAS safety test. And this is a test that's mandated through a congressional statute that the FAA has developed in partnership with industry. So it's a test that's available online for free, takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes or so to get through it. You can't really fail it because it's a training and a testing type program. And that will give you all the information you need to fly safely as a recreational flyer. Just to be clear, are, the, are those things required or are those things recommended? Those are required. So Regardless it, it, of it the is, weight? I know there's some, there were some kind of weight issues. Uh, there I there is a on. weight caveat for recreational flyers. If your drone weighs um, under 0.55 pounds, or excuse me, 0.55 pounds or less, then you do not need to register the drone. Uh, but most drones that you purchase um, are probably going to be over that 0.55 pound requirement and require registration. What's the best resource in terms of maybe an app that someone can have on their phone and, and pull up easily, you know, before doing a flight that they, that they can have? Yeah. So we have an app that we work with an industry partner on producing. It's called Before You Fly. So the letter B, the number four, the letter U, and then fly. Uh, that app is available for free on both iOS and uh, so Apple and Google stores. And it's probably going to be the easiest tool for anybody who's flying a drone to use to determine whether or not they should be flying or shouldn't be flying based on airspace restrictions. So that's something else that we try to help people understand is that when you fly a drone, you're flying in airspace that you're sharing with a lot of other aircraft. You know, just because you're below treetops doesn't mean that you're not sharing that airspace. And sometimes air, airspace can be restricted for a variety of reasons. Sometimes airspace requires a simple authorization before you fly. And that Before You Fly app is a great tool for recreational drone flyers to use to look at before their drone takes off into the, the skies. Is there any data or is there any research that, that shows whether recreational pilots are going through the required steps that they should be going through? Yes, um, th there, there are. We have currently right around 530,000 recreational drone registrations on file. Uh, so we do have a large amount of people that are going through the proper steps. The recreational UAS safety test, which we, of course we love acronyms in the FAA, so we shorten that up to be called TRUST. Uh, the TRUST just became available earlier um, uh, last year. So it really hasn't even been around for a year at this point. And we're already seeing very impressive numbers with the recreational UAS safety test. And as word spreads, as more, more people understand what they need to do with this, then we expect more people to take that test. Again, it's free, it's online, it's, it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and it'll give you all that safety information you need. What are the absolute most basic rules you think that any pilot should be following when they put a drone up in the air? Well, I, I think the easy answer is that we wanna make sure they follow all the rules, uh, really. The, the, the rules are in place not to confine somebody, but to make sure that when you're flying a drone, you're doing it in a manner that's safe for everybody, uh, not only on the ground, but other people that might be flying around that particular area. So there are some really easy ones to point out right away is you want to keep your drone below 400 feet. Uh, I know most drones are capable of flying much higher than that, but rules require you to stay below 400 feet. Um, also, if you see any other types of aircraft, as a drone pilot, you are required to give way to those aircraft. You can't interfere or, or get in the way. You need to move out of the way when those other aircraft come around. 
Uh, there are also a lot of other rules that are based on safety about flying over people. Um, probably the one I would touch on the most is making sure you keep your drone in your visual line of sight at all times. So there are rule requirements that you cannot fly your drone when you cannot see it. Uh, we have exceptions and, uh, as always. So if somebody wants to fly what we call first person view, but they can put on goggles, they're allowed to do that, but it requires some additional people around you to watch the drone. So really the bottom line is stay below 400 feet, give way to all of the aircraft and always keep your drone within your visual line of sight. Is there a particular area of violation that you tend to see more than others? I mean, you mentioned some of the rules at the very beginning, you know, the 400 foot rule, the line of sight rule, you know, the airports, and there's, there's a long list, obviously, but is, is there one violation that you tend to see more than the others? And why do you think that might be? So most of the problems that we see where we have non-compliance with the rules are due to people just not knowing what the rules are. Uh, most of the time when we go out and we investigate an incident where let's say probably our most common uh, non-compliance issues are people flying higher than 400 feet, uh, maybe people flying farther than they can see their drone, uh, what we would call beyond visual line of sight, or people flying in airspace that they did not have an authorization to fly in. And a lot of times it's simple outreach and education to those folks, even if they've already flown and they weren't supposed to, where we can make a big impact and work with that individual to help them understand what the rules are, why we have those rules, and then they can go forward and continue flying and do it in a safe way. Have there been instances where a manned aircraft was actually brought down by a drone yet? No, there, there has not. And that's something that we work every day to try and prevent. Um, it, it's something that um, everybody here in the FAA wakes up every morning that's working in the drone uh, spectrum here and tries to do their best to make sure it never happens. And we've been uh, without any major uh, accidents uh, related to drones like that. There have been some incidences where drones and aircraft have mixed, but fortunately nobody was hurt other than maybe the drone. But uh, we work every day on making sure that that doesn't become a reality. The uh, purpose of the story is not necessarily to scare people you know, into compliance, but obviously there are consequences for um, someone's actions. Uh, can you sum up the punishment that someone could face, potential fines otherwise, for flying too high, for flying too close to an airport? Sure. Uh, I, the, the FAA's position is always to try to educate first, right? We've, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, but there are times when certain situations may warrant uh, what we call enforcement action. Or, and those usually spell out fines for individual operators. Um, we have FAA orders that direct us on how we do our enforcement investigations and what those fines can be, but they've, they really depend on a variety of factors for that incident. Um, it's not just that you flew high, there's other factors that may be involved, how many times you flew, things like that. Uh, but if we do end up going through the enforcement route, fines range anywhere from um, a few hundred dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the operation. But I think the, the bottom line there is we, we don't want to have to use fines to try to, to ensure compliance. We'd rather educate, but we do have those available if needed. Remote ID, this is kind of, uh, this is a big deal. The FAA looked at it for a long time, and I guess there's finally some, some rules kind of on the books, but I don't, I'm not sure where we are with the requirements right now. Could you explain kind of, kind of how that works and, and the goal of it and what it does? Yeah, absolutely. So in December of, of 2021, uh, we instituted a, a new regulation called remote identification. It's, a, it's remote ID for drones. Now it takes effect for people flying drones in September of 2023. So we're still about a year and a half away from it being mandatory compliance. But what it's going to do is in effect become a digital license plate for a drone. So it's gonna share some basic information about that drone, such as the drone's location, uh, the altitude, the, the, the speed of uh, the serial number that's assigned to it. It does not share a person's name. It does not share their address. Um, those information pieces are kept uh, within our secure databases. We can access them, but it takes uh, either an FAA person or law enforcement to get access to that. But remote ID will help the FAA and law enforcement identify drones, where they're operating, uh, how high they are. And it's really the next step also in our drone integration pathway. So remote ID is gonna be part of the foundation for our unmanned traffic management system, which is really like air traffic control for drones. Is that done 
is the remote, remote ID done through like a radio frequency? It sends out a signal that goes a certain distance or is that more through the device that the person is operating with, a phone or whatever that's hooked up to the internet and so, sends the uh, signal online? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so remote ID is, is still under a lot of development. We're, we're, we're leaning on industry to innovate and develop how this is going to work. So in terms of what frequency spectrum it might transmit on, how far that transmission might reach, um, that's still sort of being developed at this point. Uh, so we're really leaving that up to industry as to how the remote ID functionality is going to work. So, so just to make sure, again, I, and I know I repeat everything back like a third grader, but I just want to make sure I have it all right. There is a requirement that this kind of be in place September 2023, but how exactly it works, we're still kind of fine tuning, kind of working out the details. Am I, is that correct? Yeah. So manufacturers who, who produce drones that can be flown in the United States will be required to start producing them with this remote ID capability uh, in September of 2022. So this year, people flying drones will not need to be required to broadcast until September of 2023 uh, next year. So if, you, so if you bought a drone a year ago, doesn't have remote ID, you're going to have to retrofit it to meet this requirement by September of 2023. Is that right? More than likely. Okay. Yeah, more than likely. Okay. There's a lot of nuances to the rule, but generally speaking, if your drone requires registration, then it will also be required to broadcast remote ID. And there'll be two forms of remote ID, one that's actually built or baked into the drone itself, and the other will be an aftermarket module that you can add on. There's always a lot of confusion between what is a recreational drone flyer. I mean, it if, if, I, if I'm a realtor, right, and, and I decide I'm going to use this drone to photograph this house that I'm selling, nobody's paying me to do it. So I don't need to be a commercial drone pilot. I'm just doing this for fun as part of my business. So there's a lot of confusion out there. Of what's the difference between a recreational flyer and like a commercial drone flyer? And I think that that would be a really good question to ask because it's, it's unclear for a lot of people. By all means, yeah. I mean, I think you did a better job asking it than I would have. So I'll just, I'll just let you go ahead with <laughs> yeah, the answer. Yeah, no problem. So the FAA really looks at drone pilots as being one of two groups. Uh, for the most part, you're either flying for purely recreational purposes or you're flying for some other purpose, which it could be a furtherance of a business. It could be commercial. It could be non-recreational. The, the Really, the defining line between the two, if you want to be considered a recreational drone pilot, you need to be flying 100% purely for fun. Like the reason you're flying this drone is because you love flying drones and that's all you want to do with it. Maybe you take some pictures and you share it with your family because the drones are cameras are really, really good these days. So you share some videos and things like that. That would all be considered recreational flying. When you step out of that, when you decide I'm going to use this drone to inspect my crops, I'm going to use this drone to photograph my roof to see if there's any damage from the previous storm that went through. Now you've stepped out of recreational flying. Now you're flying your drone for another purpose that has nothing to do with flying it for fun. So in that instance, you'd be considered to be operating under what we call part 107. And that's the rule that also encompasses commercial flying, but it really encompasses all drone flying with the one exception of that recreational purpose. So that's something important to remember is that the intent of what you're doing with your drone will determine what rule set you're going to need to follow. 